running. This is on. Should I turn on the AC, baby? It doesn't make a difference. Um, it's okay for me right now. Oh, I forgot my suit jacket. Oh, you very one second. <laughs> How can I do that? Okay, good. Uh, I'm not doing that suit on you. Okay. Yeah, keep her going? No, the printing. Oh, the printing. Later what did you say? Later, good? Okay, I'm excited. Beautiful. Very good. Okay. Very nice. How do I look, Gravy? I look good? <laughs> Gorgeous. Ah, oh, Hashem. Just tagging your shirt there. Oh, yeah? The bottom. Excellent. Beautiful. I don't know how it comes out when you're sitting down anyway, but... Yeah. I don't think people pay attention to my chest. Okay, great. This is testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. It's being recorded. It's done recorded. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, beautiful. My head's cut off a little bit. <laughs> I like to be perfection. My, my, what's it called? My, uh, my technical guy, God bless him, found a job. So he told me everything this past week. We have shows on a daily basis, so instead of taking things off my shoulders, yeah, more stuff on. But Baruch Hashem, no, I'm a happy friend. Anyways, he's, he's gonna hear this, David, so. <laughs> he's gonna be fixing it for me. It's still cut off a little. Matt's still cut off? It's fine. It's okay. not so bad. Okay, great. Fine, so we have everything on. Tonight at the Chazak Network, we have a very, very special guest. We have the world renowned lecturer. The one and only, I, you know, no offense to all the other speakers that speak for <laughs> Chazak, but he's one of my favorites. We, <laughs> we you just get yourself into so much trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hope they don't hear it. <laughs> we have Rabbi David Orlovsky. Welcome, Rabbi Orlovsky. When you came on the radio, he'd say the same thing about you, but you just tried to stay <laughs> up, so what do you want from me? <laughs> So Rabbi Orlovsky, thank you very come. Thank you very much for coming all the way from Eretz Yisrael. It's such a pleasure. How's your trip so far? Everything's okay. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. I last night from London. I spoke for oh, the wow. Kolel dinner in London last night. How's and the situation in London? I, I, is that the same area as France and Europe? And it's not as bad as France, but uh -huh. it's it's also problematic. Uh -huh. uh, every place in Europe right now is problematic. And uh, people, they are scared. And people are scared, and they, yeah. and they walk around, and they try not to be ostensibly Jewish. And, uh, you know, those of us uh, here in America really have to have a tremendous Hakar Satov that, uh, that the, the people and the government is more or less behind us. Baruch Hashem, yes. We actually had a major rally right outside of our office uh, when we did our ribbon cutting, and a lot of the elected officials and community leaders came in support of Eretz Yisrael. And uh, we're very, very proud to have that. So let's start with the interview with Robert Orlovsky. So, Robert Orlovsky, how did it start? How did it all, you know, happen that you became, uh, I guess, you started giving Shurim what yeshivas was in America, was it in Israel? Uh, what's the story behind all that? Well, it started when I was uh, in Los Angeles. I was learning in Chavetz Chaim and uh, also teaching a little bit. Chavetz Chaim in Los Angeles? Chavetz Chaim in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. and, um, and I was... Uh, in the, um, uh, you know, I was in the high school over there, the Chavetz Chaim High School, and um, and the day school uh, out there at the time, Amy Hebrew Academy, asked me if I would start teaching. Now, I really had no, I had very little experience, I shouldn't say I had none, because uh, I taught an afternoon Hebrew school, actually in the Uniondale Jewish Center for every burger, um, some uh, many years ago, when I was, uh, when I was still in high school. And I, and I did um, some also teaching in, uh, in the East Village. So you were a teacher as a high school student? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very impressive, yeah. okay. I was always beyond where I was supposed to be in life, you know, so now I'm a senior citizen. But uh, I always try to stay a little step ahead. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I did a little teaching, so they offered me to teach in, in, uh, in the day school. And then I got tricked into taking an NCSY chapter. I have no other way of putting it other than to say I was tricked. Um, I was living at the time in the Valley, uh, San Fernando Valley, for those of you who are not LA uh, savvy. I was in the Valley. And, um, and the local shul was looking for a, um, a youth director. And uh, people were encouraging me to apply. And both... Uh, you know, uh, two of my good friends were going for the job, and I felt like, you know what, I'm going to let, let them do it. Let them do it. 
I didn't have any experience in it per se, except for the fact that all the kids used to hang out at my house all Shabbos anyway, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so I had some, you know, I had a certain natural talent with it. But so um, I, uh, I then got a call from the Long Island, from the um, West Coast director of NCSY, would you be interested in taking another position? And I said no. So he says, can I come down and interview you? Now that summer, I was the assistant director of the Hill Day Camp in Beverly Hills. Um, and uh, I had the oldest group, the five-year-olds, <laughs> that I was personally in charge of. And, um, and I, uh, uh, he says, well, can I come down and, and speak with you? And I said, no. So he came anyway. <laughs> and uh, I, I learned some of these tricks later when I became a, a regional director. So I, I saw some of these techniques. Anyway, so he comes down, he talks to me, and he says, wow, you're perfect for the job. Now, at that time, there weren't that many firm, you know, guys uh, who stayed in L.A. So, uh, you know, if you were a firm guy and you had some personality, you were a natural. You know, it was unbelievable. So, uh... You, were, you always lived in L.A.? How's no, I went out to L.A. My parents say it's when I ran away from home. But uh, I, I went to L.A. because uh, it, it seemed like the right kind of atmosphere for where I was at the time in life. You know, I was looking for a change, I was looking to start to get involved in something, and there, the guys who were learning the yeshiva are also involved with the guys, and also, you know, they, they right. get to do things, you know, Shia Cohen, Shlita, he was the Rosh Hashiva Shai, at the time. The, the, the one, one from Priority One? Right, oh, right, right, right. Really? He was the Rosh Hashiva, and, and uh, you know, and he was working with us, and we were working with other people, and it was a very dynamic situation. So in the summer I was doing this, and he comes to the interview and says, you're perfect for the position. I said, I'm not interested. <laughs> so he says, do me a favor. Just do me a personal favor. I promise to send them some candidates. And uh, would you just do me a favor and go down, Ki'ilu, you want the job. <laughs> now, this is such a stupid thing. I fell for it. it was great. I've used this on other people. <laughs> but it was so stupid because... Just do me a favor and just go. Right. There. So I went down and, and they said to me, what would you do if you had the youth group? I said, well, I would do this, I would do that. They said, all right, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> so I said... I was supposed to say, this trick. I, was supposed to say I, I don't want the job because then you're like, then why'd you come down for the interview, <laughs> stupid? And I was like... So I took the job, and yeah. it was a very uh, old shul. It was, uh, you know, the former Bund members. This is shul. your first time being involved with the community? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did a little teaching wow. in the, you know, the next year I did some teaching in the day school. I did a little teaching in the high school, and I did some, like, you know, little stuff. But this is my first, you know, real community thing. Um, I, when I was uh, in high school, I did some youth events for my shul, you know, the youngest of North Belmore. Um, but... Uh, uh, I really had no, I didn't have too much experience, you know. So, so I walk in, and there are six kids in the chapter, and uh, and I said, we're going to win chapter of the year. I didn't even know what chapter of the year was. I didn't know what that involved, you know. But I said it with a lot of confidence, and I learned an important thing then, and that is that kids have the ability to do amazing things. Adults can't. Adults really can't. And, and when I later took over Long Island, I saw where this was true. Well, I'll, I'll get to that part. But anyway, so I take over this chapter, and we start doing some really outrageous things. And we eventually ended up with a membership of 60 members. 60 members, wow. Yeah, it was amazing. And probably half of them ended up going off to yeshivas and, uh, you know, and taking on, you know, more commitments and things. And it was just amazing. an astounding year. We won regional chapter of the year, national chapter of the year, all kinds of amazing things. And... Um, and uh, it was just it was just such an experience for me. And you just learn on the job. And it ended up that I had a natural talent for this because, um, you know, you basically just hang out with kids and have fun, which is what I'm really very good at <laughs> to this day. I just hang out and have you fun. You must have been a great regional director. Yeah, 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 I was, because I like to hang out and have fun, which is That's what I did. That's a perfect job. Yeah. So I, um, so I, by the time Hanukkah came around, National office had already heard of me, and they were offering me regions all around the country. So uh, I knew I came from uh, Long Island, and I don't know what the situation is in L.A. today, but at the time I had gone out with both of the from girls, and uh, neither one of them really went. So I decided that if I want to, you know, get married, I have to come back to the New York area, you know. So I said, what about Long Island? How, how old were you? Uh, 21, 22, something like that. I graduated high school at 16, so I was oh. always... Ahead of myself. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess so. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm a January baby, so I started too young, and then I graduated early, and I, anyway, it, it gave people motivation to beat me up as a kid. So anyway, so I, um, so I came, uh, so I said, which is Long Island. Now they told me later that they had to cover up the phone so I wouldn't hear them laughing. Now, what I didn't know is that Long Island had gone through five directors in two years. Ooh. Uh, people lasted a few months. Mm -hmm. There were no programs. It was deader than dead. Because if you're starting from scratch, you have nothing to fight against. But if you're coming in, the sixth guy in a row saying, Hi, I'm building a region here, and I'm going to make a Shabbaton, and then you disappear in two months. So nobody trusts you. So I came in. There was only one paid member in the region. And the reason that she was a paid member is because she had gotten, she started as a kid when there was a region, and she got onto national board, and you have to belong to where you come from. So she was the only member in Long Island region. And there was nothing, there were no chapters, there was no anything. So I had to start from scratch. So I went around and I spoke to everybody in the community, and they all told me it'll never work. And they explained to me why it would never work. And, uh, you know, and, and they were all right. So at the well, end, well, well, what was the reason it wouldn't work? Uh, Long Island kids aren't interested. They're apathetic. Uh, the schools aren't interested. People aren't going to be supportive. Uh, uh, they, they went through all kinds of reasons. When people usually do that to me, it gives me such an energy to. I know. I said, I said you'd appreciate this part of the story for sure. So, so, uh, so, I, what can I do? Anyway, at the end of the first year, we had a hundred paid members. At the end of the second year, we had three hundred paid members. At the third year, we had five hundred paid members. Unbelievable. So what? people said to me, "Well, how did you do it?" And I said, "I can't." Everyone convinced me I couldn't do it, but I didn't tell that to the kids. I oh, told wow. the kids they could do it, that's and it. so then they did. And that's uh, an amazing lesson. Yeah, it's unbelievable. <laughs> that's the first yeah. lesson I learned is that, you know, I, someone once bought me a poster. It said, "The impossible is the possible that hasn't happened yet." <laughs> so you know, when people tell you it's impossible, you know, so um, so I. Uh, you know, it took up. Now, once it became successful, everybody explained to me how they could have done it better. <laughs> uh, you, you know this, right? Yeah, very you, well. Before you start, everyone tells you it it's can't be done. It's impossible. You can't do and it. Once, once you, you start do it, it, everyone could have done it better. Done this, so, you could have done that. You should have done so, that. Uh, so that's why. Now, I remember one of the keen conversations I had with, with Rabbi Belitsky, who was the Rav of the Youngest of Noid Park at the time. And I explained to him, I'm trying to start, and see, well, I, I, Mamish, I just opened up the phone book and I wrote down the name of every single shul, Reform, Orthodox, and Conservatives, to see if anybody would talk to me and anybody would start a group, anything. I, I had nothing, you know, Mamish, nothing. I, I didn't have an office, I wouldn't remember, you know. You're like Hashem, so with him nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's all powerful, so, you know, big deal, you know. Anyway, it's easy to yesh me high in him, coming up. Anyway, so, um, so he says to me, uh, again, yeah, he goes, Bacher. You really think you're going to do this? And I said, yes, Rabbi, I will. Shame. He says, Bacher, you know you're out of your mind? <laughs> I said, yes, Rabbi, I do. <laughs> he said, good, because nothing's ever been accomplished by a sane person. Oh. And I remember when I spoke with Chazak last summer, and you got up and you said, people ask me, why did I start Chazak? And okay. I started because I said, we have to bring Mashiach. That's right. And no one's willing to bring Mashiach. And I remember the audience laughed. Right. And right. you said, why are you laughing? <laughs> You know, and, and everyone, you know, did a double take because nobody really believes Mashiach's going to come. Right. And nobody really believes we're going to do anything just to good Mashiach. for the rabbi. It just sounds, it sounds like yeah. a good speech, you know what I mean? Like, oh, Mashiach, right, we should be Zaycha to Mashiach, you know? Been but to actually do something about it and, like, change the world. So, anyway, so that's why uh, it's because you have to be out of your mind. If you're not out of your mind, there's no reason. So we're on the same page. A hundred percent, that's why I, I, see, I see myself and you only taller and better looking. And anyway... <laughs> <laughs> and younger, you know. And, uh, I'll make sure edit that off of video. Except, except for that, it's exactly the same. <laughs> You're funnier. Right? Yeah, Baruch Hashem, I have that. <laughs> so I ran yeah. NCS Wine Long Island for nine years. and um, Nine years, wow. Yeah, and I took a, when I got married, I took a break. and I went. You, to you married a Queens girl, right? Yeah. 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 She All you girls. are Queens fans. <laughs> 68th Avenue. Yeah. Right? yeah. The former Simi Gans. What, what was the last so, thing? Gans. Gans, Gans, Gans. So uh, 68th yeah. Avenue. So uh, mom was right around. I hope you went right across them before he gave us. I, I called right away as soon as I landed. <laughs> but I, uh, I, uh, they lived right across from the cemetery, you know. Mm. You know, over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I found that but a little depressing the first time I came, but, you know. <laughs> Gosh, you know, the stores are right across the street. They're going to be like, very busy soon. Like yeah. Casey Mason coming. You know, everyone's going to be going shopping. <laughs> and, uh, the corner now is a nice uh, 
a nice Palestinian yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, chicken restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly nice. Anyway, so um, halal meat. Dude. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, so I took off a year and I went to Israel uh, to learn and uh, actually went for smicha and. Um, what what yeshiva? Uh, um, I was learning in I was learning in Chavetz Chaim and I went to a smicha shiver of Dissen. And I got a smicha from Rav Kopchitz that year, and um, and I remember um, I the learning was going so well that I didn't want to leave, oh. and I went to Rav Scheinberg and to Rav Yoshev, and they both told me, Mitzvah Efsha Al Piacherim, fine, if Efsha you got to do it. Oh, they wow. sent me back. Yeah, so I stayed for another five years and. In uh, no, and went back to Nazi as well. Oh, they sent so, you back. They sent me back. They oh, wow. They, uh, can you just try, you said that what what a revelation of Scheinberg? So in Scheinberg, I was there for a half an hour. He kept saying, "You know the importance of sitting and learning, but you know the importance of Klai Yisrael, the importance of sitting and learning, the importance of like, and I was like back and forth like this for a half an hour, you know, and uh, and uh, and finally he begrudgingly said, you know, um, if you no if one you, else could do no the one job, else could do it, then you have to do it, and Shh. the person who. I, in fact, I remember I was learning Chavetz Chaim at the time, and Rameshu Che said, "Look, when I asked him, he said, look, I want you to stay.' And they gave it so I said to Rav Scheinberg because he was sure there was not a chance that Rav Scheinberg was right. going to send me back, you know. So uh, he had sent his his gabai Rav Yosef Kramer along, you know. So uh, so he was shocked. Rav Scheinberg <laughs> never did. So he said, like, now we'll go to Rebel Yosef.'" Now, I don't know, did you, did you ever get to go to Rebel Yosha? I had this chutz, actually, too. So, you know, you're, yes. you're sitting outside in a waiting room. And, and the house is like... Right, this tiny little house, and there's some big Rosh Hashiva, and then some lady with a chicken, you know what I mean? And, like, <laughs> it's, just, it's just like a whole cross-section of Klai Yisrael. And we came in, and we were in and out in five minutes. And he, he listened to the whole question, and he says, Listen, uh, Mitzvah comes along, Efshah Piyachem, fine. Efshah, you have to do it. If others can do it, you got to do it. And uh, so we heard Kriva says to him, would you say he's mechuyev? He has to? So we actually gave him a look. He said, let's say Marutza. It's <laughs> the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Beautiful. So I came back and... Uh, back to Antius Wine, Long Island. Long Island. For another five years. For another five years. So, so it was nine years old. Yeah. Fourteen. I passed and my uh, we moved to Far Rockaway. It was Far Rockaway at the time. Next door to the White Shore, and across the street from the Aguda. And, um, and uh, it was interesting. <laughs> Um, Eitan Fino, who's now the Rav of the White Shul, he was a kid at the time of the White Shul, and he remembers I used to daven in the youth minion of the White Shul. And, that was uh, the time of Rabbi Pelkowitz, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah Rabbi Pelkowitz, a very, very special fellow. And, uh, but the main shul, you know, people had a lot more to talk about than I did. <laughs> There's much to talk about. And the kids didn't want to talk because they wanted to get out of there. <laughs> so I would... Uh, I would uh, dive it over there. So he still remembers me from that minute. He said it was all kids and Rabbi Olavsky, you know. <laughs> so I think that's really, uh, you don't have to say that. Just say it was all kids. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And Rabbi Olavsky. You know, Rabbi also a kid, you know. So, um, so I lived, so eventually yeah, we moved back to Israel. Yeah, how did, uh, how did that move happen? Well, the, I, I decided, you know, I had taken NCSY for me as far as I could. And I was Baruch Hashem at the time, really more or less, you know, at the top of my game. And the region was going great. And people said to me, "Why are you crazy? Why are you leaving now?" I said, "Because I'm not machadish anything. I'm not. I'm just maintaining. Right. And for me, I've I've maxed this out. You know, so it's time for me to go." And uh, <laughs> I remember one guy said to me, "When you make all those half dollars, you're not supposed to listen. You know, that's for the kids. <laughs> when we tell them that you become from, go up there and start learn. They're not talking about you. That's not for you. That's for everyone else." <laughs> So I went off. And it's my, a big move, you should know. It was an unbelievable move. move. And the plan was to go for three years. I was going to sit and learn. I wanted to work on practical halacha. And, uh, you know, and Ian, and, uh, you know, prepare myself. My, my, my Rabbinical my, career. Yeah, I was going to go into Rabbanus. That's what I figured I was going to do next. You know, my wife was a Rebbitzin already when I met her. So uh, <laughs> she was all set to do so this. So you're all ready for it. I was all set. So, uh, but I, the longer I stayed, the more I couldn't see myself leaving. You know, as long as you stayed in, in it, so, uh -huh. you know. In fact, I said originally, I said it's going to take me three years to prepare for a bonus. I realized it's going to take me three years just to learn how to live like a Jew again. Now you know this because you work in the field. When you live in Kiev, you know you're 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 on the front lines all the time. And so I found that here I was now a civilian, and I didn't know how to sit through a davening. 
because I was always running Shabbat to Nim, and I'm always looking around, and I'm always running around. They said, the kids are out here. This is going on. This is going on. I didn't know how to sit in shul anymore. You you're know? always running around. Because you're always so busy taking care of everybody else that you don't know how to just take care of yourself. So it was a process for me to slowly learn how to get back into things. Mm -hmm. And um, and I learned for, uh, you know, a few years. And uh, I went to Psyche Kuchelevsky, and that was a big schuss. And, um, and then eventually I... Uh, you Wait, when, when did the speaking, the, the lecture, uh, so the, the, is that through NTSY or so that, that happened, didn't really so, start over there? So I started, when I was there already by the second year, so there was a fellow with Shimon Kurland who was also learning by Rupsvi. Is and he related to Rabbi Kurland from Shari Yashuv? I don't know. know. He's uh -huh. from Chicago originally. Uh -huh. He now runs Dar Chibina where I work. Uh -huh. So he, um, um, he was running Orla which was Or Sameach's training program for people going out into the field. And... Um, and he asked me if I would lecture about Kirif. So I figured, okay, no, enough about it, you know. So I started teaching there a little bit, and that, that got me back into the, you know, speaking a little bit. And then, um, Or David offered me to become the Mashkiach. Rabbi who? Uh, it was a yeshiva called Or David. Or David. Rabbi uh. Granovsky and Rabbi Flam, that's all. They were running at the time. And I, um, you know, part of my job was to recruit. So I started flying around the country, and uh, you know they would, he would buy me a Vuza on Northwest. Uh, I don't know if they still have a Vuza. It was called a Visit USA ticket, oh. where you pay a s s sum of money, and then you can travel on any Northwest flight that um, that uh, you can go standby. So you know you could end up killing a lot of time in the airport, you know, <laughs> and uh, and wherever you're flying, you go through Detroit. You know, if you want to go from <laughs> New York to Philadelphia, you change planes in Detroit. You know, everything was in Detroit, Northwest. So, um, uh, but I, um, uh, I started going around. I was speaking in schools, and people started to see me there. Were, were, were you the funny type, or? Well, you know, did, it's, did it start like? <laughs> it's interesting to say that. I, I always was more or less. That was my, that was my personality. I'll give you an example. You know, uh, Ruby Y Y. Rubinstein. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So. Rabbi Yy is very funny. In many ways, I, I think he's funnier than I am. Really? And uh, he agrees with me. So, <laughs> <laughs> it kills him when they film me as like the funniest rabbi. Like, you are the I guess they haven't heard me, you know? <laughs> so he's Scottish. I always tell him I'm the funniest one in English. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, so Rabbi Yy um, had to go to Switzerland. And they said, here, rabbis do not tell jokes. And he was completely straight. I don't. I couldn't be completely straight. I don't know how. It's just part of my personality is that I'm. I'm funny. I was always funny. I mean, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, you know, um, when I was in high school, I, I was a magician. Really, the amazing Orlo. That's right. Orlo I used to do uh, magic tricks, and uh, the way it, it, the secret of magic is always misdirection. You know, because you get people not to pay attention right. to what you're doing. So there's two ways to do this, and that is to be extremely skillful or to distract them because you're funny, which is what I did. <laughs> <laughs> so my skills were not great, but I, you know, I pulled up the, 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 the tricks because people had a good time. That was the main That's thing. Good. I don't know if they like my tricks, but they had fun. That was the main How can you do it at, at our events? You know, some uh, magic here and there. You know what? The way things are going, you know, because like you said, you know, when you introduced me, the world famous speaker. <laughs> world famous speaker means a guy with no job. So. <laughs> So I may be going back to doing birthday parties. <laughs> whoever needs, hey kids. Whoever needs the magic. Hey whoever kids. Kids. Pick a number. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so um, so I. Uh, uh, <laughs> Where so were we up to? <laughs> so I started going around. I was All speaking right. in schools, and people heard me, and they started saying, oh, "Are you available to speak at a shul? Oh. To speak at this? To speak at that?" And I slowly started, you know, getting into it. Now, to be fair, when I was in NCSY. So I'd often have to speak from the pulpit, you know. Uh -huh. I would speak uh, to either to thank the, the shul or I would, uh, I would uh, actually give the sermon or whatever it is. So I was already uh -huh. polishing, right. you know, getting up to speak. Some of those were absolutely terrible, you know, I remember <laughs> now. Um, but uh, but it, it gives you experience, you know. Right. It reminds me that William Faulkner, somebody just asked me, how do, you, how do you become a speaker? So I said, William Faulkner was speaking at a writer's conference in uh, Columbia University. And he said, how many people here are serious about writing? And everybody raised their hands. So he says, then why are you here? Why aren't you home writing? You know? <laughs> so I tell people, if you want to speak, the, the way to do it is speak. 
Just find Go every out. opportunity to talk, you know? And uh, the more you speak, the better you'll get at it, you know? Uh, you drive with a kid who just got his license, you know? It's it's hair raising, you know? <laughs> it's scary. And somebody like... like the more you drive, the more you the get... The more you drive, the more experienced you are. You and don't that's have true to with anything in life, right? Hundred percent, you know. Practice that's what you see when perfect. people first start becoming from <clears throat> Shabbos is mostly trying to remember what you have to do and what you can't do, you know. Or davening is mostly remembering what I'm supposed to say, and what I'm supposed to stand, and what I'm supposed to sit, and what I'm supposed to do. You know, it's easier by the Sfardim because you guys chant everything together. <laughs> us Ashkenazim, they leave us on our own. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we have to, you know, you spend a lot of time just getting down the moves yeah. before you can actually make it meaningful. Okay. So, uh, so I had already some experience, so I started speaking a little bit. And then, <clears throat> just out of the blue, um, a neighbor of mine wanted to make a share in her house. And uh, she had tryouts. And uh, the first person said no, and the second person said no, so I was chosen. <laughs> I was <their> choice. <laughs> and uh, I started giving a share in Masil Sharm, which is what Beautiful. I taught in Ordovit. And then they started making tapes. Back then, that's before they had who, downloads. They who, had who gets CDs. the credits for these tapes? That probably um, actually. Worldwide. Uh, what happened is people started asking me, "Do you have tapes from the Shiurim?" So I was like, "I don't know anything about tapes." So uh, someone said said to me, "Rabbi Alprin has tapes." Your Highness and Alprin. Uh, I know he comes to America to speak from time to time, and I asked him, and he said, "There's a little lady in Meir Sharm, uh, Mrs. Weberman, Alvashol." And she has the equipment in a little apartment in, in Meir Sharm. And, and you give her the master, and she copies them. So I started distributing tapes. And suddenly, I became known to a whole audience that had no idea who I was. But they enjoyed Powerful. listening to the tapes, you know? I don't know if he wants his name mentioned publicly, but there's an Adam Gadol who gives a shir Miss Sosa Sharm, and he used to say to me, I listen to your tapes before I prepare the wow. shir. Wow. So, uh, you uh, know. Are, are these tapes, I hope they are, I'm saying turned into CDs or... So what I did is I re I started redoing it, and on my website, rabbiorlovsky.com. RabbiOrlovsky.com. That's -R. Rabbi Orlovsky. <laughs> <laughs> O-R-L-O-F-S-K-Y. I'm such, an, I'm such an un I put an F-S in my name. F-S means zero. So <laughs> F-S-K-Y. So. Anyway, so um, uh, I have, uh, I, I started redoing them because, uh, you know, I... Uh -huh. well, and I they said, are available. They're available for download, oh, download. now. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. So those of you who know about downloads, I don't, but uh, <laughs> my son in law runs the tape. I'm supposed to be supporting him in Kolo, so instead I gave him my website. So, <laughs> so he makes the money. But anyway, um, so uh, so the tape so started all, going around. all the share on that site. I met somebody from uh, Lakewood, and he said to me, there's a big bin of tapes, you know, of all the different speakers. That There's a gamak that you can take out the tapes. Yours is always empty, you know. So I thought, my gosh, so many people in Lakewood are listening to it. Then I realized there must be some Kanoi smashing them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so suddenly people started getting out, and I started actually getting offers to come and speak, like, you know, unsolicited. The power of tapes. So yeah. Maybe. So then a guy in Harnof, uh, Tzvi Ackerman, um, he wanted me to give a shir for the community. Okay. So I gave a shir before Rosh Hashanah, and I gave a shir before Yom Kippur, and then he wanted me to give one of the parasha. Those days, I'm saying, was the rub known... Um, main. I'm saying, did, did they come out in the hundreds like they do nowadays, or at the beginning? Yeah, it was in the neighborhood. People knew who I was. And oh, really? You get hundreds of people oh, coming at the beginning. And um, I spoke for Shunning Yom Kippur, and then I started giving a shir on the parsha, and um, and that's been going on now for about 17 years. You know, every other Motzi Shabbos I speak. And um, where is this every other Motzi Shabbos? It's in Veinov, which is on Ten Parnas in Harnof. And it's mostly Harnof people. Come. Harnof next to Ravavadi, right? And uh, it's... Uh, Ravavadi is on the top in Kablan. This, you have to come down to one of the lower right. sections it. of the neighborhood. But it's not far. Um, and um, and uh, from that, more people started to hear about me. And I started getting more offers, etc. And then I, uh, I left Radavid after my father passed away. And I took over a year to learn. And then when I was looking around, so Ursamech took me on. Uh -huh. And uh, with the understanding that I would also speak for them in America. And I started doing lectures for them where they had branches and, uh, you know, programs for them. And that put me in a different, a different stage. Map. People started uh -huh. to see me differently. And then I started getting more offers. And eventually when I left Ur Sameach, I decided to try my hand at, you know, seeing if I could uh, make a living uh, speaking. <laughs> I still haven't found out. <laughs> 
but that's yeah. all I do. I don't have another job, so you know. So uh, so I make these trips for like a week and a half, and I run around and I talk and. Uh, well, and like I say, like world renowned lecture. You told me London and uh, yeah, yeah. Australia and America. So I was Hashem. supposed to go to Australia, but uh, you know I had a heart attack. So uh, yeah, in January I had a heart attack like, and a bypass. Okay? Uh, you know, Baruch Hashem. You know, um, it was uh, pretty hairy and. Uh, you know, I mean, when the guy did the angiogram, he said, I don't know how you're still alive. So, really? Yeah, he said, someone upstairs must like you. Wow. So, uh, every now and then I meet people, they say, you know, we were davening for you. I said, well, it worked. <laughs> I'm yeah. still here. Hashem, Hashem. So, I didn't think I was up to the trip to Australia. It's a 24-hour flight each wow. way. Wow. You know? There's a big community over there? Um, I haven't been there. But uh, right. Sydney and Melbourne are supposed to have a good commu right. big community. So. I know that the Rub mentioned quite a few times Chavetz Chaim, Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim, Chavetz Chaim yeah. in, in Los Angeles, Chavetz Chaim in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, did the Rub have a connection with the Rosh Yeshiva, the, the Rav Hanach sure. Leibowitz? Sure. I ended up with Chavetz Chaim. It was actually interesting. I went to the Hebrew Academy of Nassau County, which Pink. is yeah, really? co-ed high school. You? Right? That's right. <laughs> you know what? You'd be surprised who came out of Hank. You know really? what I mean? Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm saying I. Just, you know, uh, Rabbi Fendel. I know a lot of great Rabbi people. Rabbi Gadesman and, and my Rabbi, who was Rabbi Whale, were just such exceptional people. They're not the only exceptional people, but they're the ones right. who had the, the greatest influence on me. And uh, so Rabbi Gadesman was the touring director of this camp in um, Erzsel called Stechemet. It was run by Rabbi... I think it's still around, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. At the time, it was run by Rabbi Eli Teitelbaum. Um, Baruch Chait was the head counselor. You know, it was like... So he asked me if I wanted to go. So I was like, okay, sounds good. You know, I could go to, go to well, Israel to camp. Yeah. <laughs> and when I got there, it was very yeshivish. No, I was coming from Hank. Before that, I had been going to Camp Raleigh. I don't even know if Camp Raleigh's still around. <laughs> camp Raleigh. Uh, and... Um, and uh, suddenly I'm here, and like I'm the only kid over in Bermuda without a hat, you know. <laughs> and uh, my, my counselor was Satma. Really? <laughs> yeah, he used to wake up in the morning. Rose, Rose, you know, Rose. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in, a, I'm in the Holocaust, you know. I was like, Rose, you know, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, you're like, how did I get here? So yeah, right. So, but that suddenly pushed me in a whole different thing. And my learning rebbe was the guy Saul Framowitz. Um, at the time, he was my learning rebbe. There's a Framowitz in Queens. Uh, yeah. you, uh, I assume that's them. Really? really? Yeah. Interesting. This Saul, he had a brother Nate, you know. But uh, but uh, Saul was my my learning, learning rebbe. rebbe, and he basically told me that if you don't go to Chavetz Chaim, then there's no chance of you getting into the next world. Really? And I was a young, impressionable <laughs> young man. I I brought that in. You know? I was already determined that I was going to become a rabbi. So now I think, okay, I'll become a shiva. You know, it's a big deal. Same same basic idea. You know. And so I had my heart set on Chavetz Chaim. Now I was coming out of Hank. I was a nice kid. We did two hours of Gemara a day. You know, and right. I suddenly dropped it. I went to Eretz Yisrael. Um, dropped in this place, Medrash, from like seven o'clock in the morning till ten thirty at night. You know, <laughs> and it was it was grueling. You know, but uh, you know, I I became part of Chavetz Chaim. You know, and, the uh, one over here in Forest Hills. So I was there, and I was in Rochester, and I was in Forest Hills. Oh wow! And um, and the Shiva. Whenever I had an issue, I would go and speak to the Shiva. And, <laughs> and he just. He was. He had so many gifts. One of his gifts was, and it was. A, it had to be a trick. It couldn't be real. And I fell for it every single time. Whenever I would go in to see him, he would start off by asking my advice on a problem. He would ask you. Yeah, I was a kid, and he said to me, "We're thinking of opening up over here. What do you think, etc." And and it sounded so sincere that I just answered him, and I was like, "Well, I think like this." And he goes, "Yeah, but what about this?" You know, and he would talk the whole thing through with me. And he'd say, oh, that's a good point, you know. Amazing. Uh, now, what can I do for you? You know, but it put me in a whole different position because he was machsh of me, you know. He made me yeah. feel like that was important. Now, I mean, okay, so it's, it's a chazal. You know, she brings it right at the beginning. Right, right. Na'asa adam salmenu. Right. The Kodesh Baruch Hu asked the advice. Advice from the angels, right. He doesn't need, right. need their advice, you know. So, but the Rashid would always, no matter what it was. He would always ask and for advice from one, the angels. One time I went to see him, he was an Ed show. And I felt like I wasn't getting the same attention, the same, you know... From the Rosh Hashim. Yeah, and I felt a little bad about it, you know? And I, I told this guy by afterwards. So he says, oh, I guess you didn't know. I said, what? He, goes, he was going that afternoon in for surgery. He was in terrible pain. But he didn't cancel his appointment with you because he didn't want to disappoint wow. you. Wow. So, that was a man. Gadol. Amazing. So uh, he was... 
Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky once said, the greatest Talmud of the Alta of Slobotka is in this room, and he never met him. What does and that mean? That means that Rav Henoch managed to capture what Slobotka Musa was about, you know, more than anybody. And, uh, and even though he had never seen the Alta, you know. Right, was, right, right. And, and we see the, the accomplishments of, of, of the Adam Dadal worldwide, Baruch Hashem. Anyways, Rabbi Orlovsky, I want to jump to, you know, we, we kind of uh, heard a lot about your past and how it all started. Um, you know, Baruch Hashem, you speak constantly. Is there like one insight or one chidush or one, you know, joke? <laughs> something that you could share with our audience, maybe a story, maybe something that you feel that, uh, that uh, you know, your best, uh, best sheer, best lecture, <laughs> so, you know, a point, something we could... Uh... Rabbi Tversky. Avram J. Tversky. Yeah, he said, um, I don't remember the number of books now, but when I heard it, it was something like 20-something uh, books. He that says, he authored. He says... He says, I didn't write 25 books. I wrote one book 25 times. You know I mean? <laughs> it's, the same. it's the same idea that I try to say in different ways. So, um, you I probably I, have dozens of different lectures. Right. right. I have dozens of different lectures, and but I try to say one thing. You know, What I always try to say is something that is so incredibly important, and maybe I'll, I'll back it up a bit. You know, um, People ask me why there's a phenomena today of kids who come from committed homes who are leaving. Going off the derch. Off the derch. Right. Or as they say, off the D. Off you know what I mean? D, eh? <laughs> uh, you know, or why there are people who aren't happy and people aren't fulfilled, etc. And I say... You know, I remember the Rav Kansi speaking about this topic. It's there's many lectures on terrible. that. Terrible. Right? But, but I, I was speaking once uh, to a group of parents who were asking this question in many different ways. And I said, I, I could sum it up, I think, really in one, in one step. And there's a lot of reasons, but there's one thing. When I started in the Hebrew Academy of Nassau County in 1964... Oh, you're that old? Yeah. <laughs> not according to a revised biography. I'm, I'm going to have a reboot. I think if Superman can, so can I. You know what I mean? So, but this was about uh, 12 years before I was born. And uh, I started... <laughs> according to my new biography. But, uh, you know, I, I can't mention any names, but I think I'll, I should just tell you a little secret of the trade. A lot of people who make their living being speakers are very conscious of their appearance and so they don't want to look too old and they want to look differently than they are and people do different kind of things to make sure that they look good I don't anyway <laughs> <laughs> take me as I am and that's it it, is what it, is. <laughs> I'm not, it is what it is that's right anyway so um, um, so when I started it, the general consensus was that orthodoxy was dead in America and the, that's that's way what used. To, uh, uh, it's hard to believe today, but yeah, you know, every shul that opened was a conservative shul, and everybody, if you were if you were Orthodox, that meant you were an old man who lived in the the, the, the Bronx. Well, or we're seeing the exact Brooklyn, opposite you know, nowadays, which is for me, I'm saying I'm young. That's yeah, I mean, shocking. kids today can't believe yeah. it. But I mean, when it, at that point, it was a given that Orthodoxy was was dead. And you had to be crazy to think otherwise. And uh, so when I went to an Orthodox day school, 1964, nice kid from Long Island, North Merrick, Long Island. It's not a not a not a Yiddish stadt, as they say in Yiddish. You know, it's not a Jewish place. And um, and I went to this. They they gave you a feeling that you were a hero, that you were doing something unbelievable. You were saving the Jewish people. And if you were bad, and kids are bad, you know, and kids make trouble. So they kids gave you a kids. guilt trip, and they gave you a musa schmooze. But but there was not a there was never a few that were going to throw you out. There weren't enough of us to throw anybody out. You know, right. you, they needed you. So there was a sense of being needed. And today, a kid gets a message: we don't need you here. You're out. You know, you step out of line. You're out. You know, I got three people waiting for your place. And uh, and you hear people say this in different ways, although nobody actually comes out and says it, but. We have too many from Jews. There's not enough housing. There's not enough parking right. spots. You know what I mean? I can't. Not enough spots in school. You know. So if we throw out a few, we can afford it. Right. When I was growing up, you couldn't. You needed every Jew, and so everybody felt choshev. When someone tells me I have a kidney and I, I'm afraid he's going to go off, what should I do? I said, get him involved in a project where they need him. Put him in a chesed organization. Put him in something because everybody has to feel like they're needed. And therefore, my one message that I always try to bring across is. The Eitzahara, the evil inclination, the Satan, the death wish, call him what you will. <laughs> yeah? He doesn't want to get you to sin. 
that's small time stuff, you know. Rabbi Shapiro once said, the best way to rob a bank is not to come in with a mask and a gun. The best way to rob a bank is to take the bank manager and tie him up and sit in his seat and run the bank. That's the best way to rob a bank. This guy. So, so the Yitzhah doesn't want to come in and get you to sin. He wants to convince you that you don't make a difference. Wow. And terrible. we're we're in a terrible matzah right now, right? Spook People shoot situation. missiles at us yeah. and our soldiers are in Gaza. And the Yitzhah wants to make you believe that when they say that little bit of Tehillim at the end of davening, that doesn't make yeah, a difference. You do. say it, you don't say it, you think it, God's listening to your prayers. If you knew that what you do and what you say is changing the course of history, that you're shaking things up, who would believe it? Right? Yeah, right. Now, I don't know, you know, we have to interview you one time. You know? <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know, did, did anybody look at you, you know, before you started this and say, hey, here's a guy who's going to start a major organization and reach out to, you know, thousands of people? No, right? You're, you're, you're an ordinary guy, right. you know? I, I revel in my ordinariness, you know? I once had a Rebbe <laughs> who, after I was already pretty effective in the field, he met somebody, he says, tell me, is Olasky effective? He says, yeah. He goes, I never thought he'd amount to anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't blame him. Oh, you're a baby. I mean, look at you. Is that guy? They're shocked. They're shocked. So I never thought he'd amount to anything, you know? You know the funny thing about uh, your also. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is that uh, they were right. They were right because if you go by the normal way that world goes, you can pick out who the winners are going to be. But it has nothing to do with that. Right. It has to do with, you know, if you're willing to be an Eved Hashem and you're willing to do God's work, so okay, so I'm not the smartest, I'm not the most talented, I'm not the, you know, etc. But God wants me to do this, I'm going to do it. Right. And that's always my attitude. And that's why, like people say to me, they say, you know, I listened to your tapes from, you know, 20 years ago, and I listened to you today. You haven't changed. I said, I know, because I'm, I'm completely the same person. You're focused you, and you I have that message. I, if you ever, if I ever stop to think, people say to me, you know how many people's lives you've changed, you know how many people, I would go out of my mind, I can't, I can't, I can't assimilate that right. information, you know? My my parents brought me up to believe that I was a low yutzlach and I would never <laughs> succeed at anything. And no matter what I did, if they didn't take care of me I would I would just be a failure, you know? And 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 I have that message integrated in me and I didn't realize at the time that it was a gift. Because you know, you, you get you this should much never attention. be satisfied with what you're doing. You know, you get this much attention. If for the average person, it would go to the head. Right. But right. I was luckily beaten down enough, so. That <laughs> <laughs> so no matter what you do in life, it's Andy. Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever I do, I hear that voice saying, "Eh." That's <laughs> good. Yeah, Baruch Hashem. So that's the message I give people. I say, you can make a difference. You are important. When you do a mitzvah, when you daven, when you say to him, when you do anything, it's you're changing nothing. history. It's like people always tell me, what's the big deal if I just, you know, not do this? Just a little bit different. Of so course. I always give, give them the muscle, the, the example of the email address. You know, you miss one dot. What's the big deal if I miss a dot? Or, or there's another quick story that there was a robber. He went on the roof and he couldn't steal anything, couldn't get into the house. So he's like, you know, there's some knob, some gold knob. I'll just take the gold knob. That's and, right. And then the, the next thing he knows, he takes it off and the chandelier inside the house crashes and <laughs> kills a few people. So, you know, the small things do count. People, people have to yeah, remember that. But it's even more than that. It's not even the small things. It's that you don't believe... And I don't mean you, but the average person right. out there doesn't believe that they're chashev and can make a difference. No, I also, I, I, don't, I don't believe in Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but, but you at least, in, in fact, can turn around and show a whole series of accomplishments, you know? There's this um, e-card that someone sent me once. E-card? <laughs> yeah, on a birthday. I don't remember the whole thing, but it's like... Um, Happy birthday, each year you're getting fatter. <laughs> Happy birthday, what have you done that matters? Happy birthday, you have not accomplished much, but you didn't die this year, I guess that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a lot of people who believe that. They get that and they're like, okay, you know. Yeah. I think well, I'm not dead. Who cares? Who cares what I do? Does it make a difference to me? If I, I've heard this more than once from, from people. He said, if I died tomorrow, you know, I don't think it would make a difference. I don't think God cares whether I'm in this world or not. I said, if he didn't want you here, he's got no shortage of ways of getting rid of you. Right, right. The yeah. fact that you're here means that you can do something that nobody else can do. And therefore, to me, the most important thing is to empower people. I've heard this from more than one person. When I asked them, why do you come to my shiurim? And they said, because it's the only place where I walk out feeling good that I'm a from Jew. 
Otherwise, you get beaten up all the time. You know, right, you're you're no good, you're no good, you're no good. There's an old story where this uh, this guy was uh, was in Poland and he was reading the anti-Semitic paper. So he says, "Why are you reading that 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 trash?" He says, "I love reading this." He says, "Why?" He says, "When I read the from you know papers, we're in trouble. Where everyone hates us. You know, no money. Everything's terrible happening." Well, their papers. This, is, we all run the world. The world I, the family, <laughs> I love reading this. You know. <laughs> So that's that. the idea. When a person, you know, it's like when I say I didn't tell the kids they can't do it, so they were able to accomplish something that I knew couldn't be done, and and that's the answer. Every single person out there could do great things. That's a powerful message, Abrahamski. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us, you know, this video and the, the audio is going to be viral. I'm saying there's no viral, <laughs> viral. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I'm saying get that message out to your family members, to your children, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your coworkers. Every single person is a Gem. You it, change the world. That's right. We could do it, right? You change the world. Moshe Chait, you'd love to tell the story. When he was a kid, he went to the zoo, and the lion roars, and he got scared. And he said to the zookeeper, can he break out of the cage? He says, yes, but don't worry, he doesn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, that's every one of us. We could break out of the cage. We could do unbelievable great things, but the Yetzirah keeps convincing us, God doesn't care what you do. God does. Try this with the average firm person. Say, does God like you? Now, if a person can get past that, because they know the correct answer is yes, even though they don't believe it, but anyway, they'll say yes. They say, do you think God's impressed with you? I haven't met one from person who could say yes. And I was like, but don't you understand what it means to be from today, that a person is still Shomer Torah and Mitzvahs? After, after 2,000 years of exile and all the oppression and all the difficulties and all the taivas that are out there and all the desires and everything that we could be doing and we're still here? You know how valuable that is? But... But everybody just lets the ATR convince them. They're no good. Powerful, powerful. Rabbi Ilovsky, I love the message. I love the message that we have to tell ourselves. You know, the power of the mind. I, I actually, believe it or not, spoke about this topic recently. Uh, is that, uh, you know, we control ourselves. We have to have a positive out outlook that everything is for the best. Even things that, 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 are, that are not so good. Rabbi Ilovsky, can you please toss a joke to make us happy? <laughs> <laughs> so we can put a, put a smile on our face. <laughs> uh, <laughs> i tell you a joke. Um, I, the reason why you coughed is because you had to think of one, right? And no, because uh, I just get nervous when I have to tell a joke. <laughs> because you notice, I don't usually tell jokes, I just make funny observations about life, you know? And, and by this point in my career, I have such credibility that I just walk out and I go, Good evening! And everyone starts <laughs> laughing, you know? We just laugh. So, someone just... told me they were at a sheer once and I told a joke, and everybody's laughing. And this guy turns to his friend and goes, I don't get it! The other guy says, Neither do I! But, but they knew we just laugh. that it must have been funny and the chisarin was in them. They, they're right. the ones who are lacking that they couldn't get the joke, but not that I wasn't yeah. funny, you know? But um, you have yourself in a good position. position. Tell, yeah, right. So I just, you know, I just went up there and go, Hi! And I was like, Ah! That guy's so funny. Anyway. So. <laughs> I did a joke once for a, uh, for a yeshiva, you know, the guys were 18, 19 years old. I don't know, about something about Jimmy Durante. And they all started laughing. I said, you've never heard of Jimmy I've Durante. Heard of you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. you know? But it sounds funny. So they Remember, Olofsky said it. It must so be funny. Right. Um, so I actually have a joke I took from my friend Ruby Wai. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but it's a very funny <laughs> joke. So <laughs> when I have to tell him a joke, I tell him this joke. Um, so uh, this guy just gets married. And he says to his chavrusa, you want to come over for dinner? So he says, uh, uh, sure. He says, okay. Why not? So they come over, he goes in the kitchen, and he's only married a couple of months. And he says to his wife, he says, uh, you know, I brought Yanko over for dinner. She says, what? I only made for two people. He goes, all right, I'll tell him to leave. Yanko! Because now you can't tell him to leave, he's here already. <laughs> so what are you going to do? He says, well, cut everything up into small pieces, you know. But don't offer doubles. Whatever you do, don't offer seconds, because I don't have enough. It's fine. So they have the fish. Everyone gets a small piece of fish, you know. He says, how's the fish? He says, delicious. He says, do you want another piece? The guy goes, no. <laughs> you sure? No. Okay. They serve the soup. Everyone gets a half a bowl of soup. He says, how's the soup? Oh, it's delicious. You want some more? Uh, no. You sure? No. Okay. Then he serves the chicken, you know. Everyone gets a small piece of chicken. He says, how's the chicken? Oh, it's delicious. You want another piece? The guy goes, uh, no. All right. I have a piece of cake and tea, you know, and say goodnight. So he says, what were you doing? I Why told did you, you not to ask him? I told you not to offer seconds. He goes, oh, I forgot. Why didn't you say something? She says, I was kicking you under the table the whole time. <laughs> he 
said, I didn't feel anything. <laughs> <laughs> let me do it. Let me explain the joke to you guys. <laughs> she was kicking the gas, not her husband. Now, I have to tell you, when Wai Wai tells it, it's so much funny because he puts up this great expression. The guy goes, goes eh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he told me that joke the first time. I laughed so hard. But, uh, no wonder. That's a great joke. You that's know? a lie. Sometimes, you know, when I see a joke, I'm not so confident about myself. Yeah. I, I explain my jokes to people after the joke. So I have this trick that I use. You can, if, you, if you listen when I speak, I have this trick. After I tell a joke, I right away start talking. And then if people laugh, I stop. Because there's nothing worse than telling a joke and going, and nobody laughs. laughs. And you're like, yeah, well. <laughs> I have to tell you, when you speak for an audience that doesn't know me, and they introduce me as the funny rabbi, which is the worst introduction you can possibly get. Because now people because are when, judging you. Because they know, because they're like, oh yeah, let's see. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm so, not... so people are like, this guy is so funny. I have to tell I dare you not to laugh. I was like, oh my gosh. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I get up, and I'm like, I'm, uh, you know, and everyone's like, yeah, <laughs> go ahead, make me laugh. You know? So I say, um, I say, you know, there's nothing scarier than hearing about a funny rabbi. Because when you ever hear rabbis who try to tell jokes, it makes <laughs> Never. them it's just painful, you know? They like they give me a serious I'd like to begin with a humorous anecdote. You know, like, <laughs> oh boy, you know. So I, this this is a true story. A rabbi came over to me and said, I heard this joke and I told it over and it didn't go over well. I said, Well let me hear you tell the joke and I'll tell you what's wrong with it. You know what I mean? I, I know a little bit about jokes, you know. So he tells me the joke and I said, No, 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 you're telling it wrong. Here's how you're supposed to tell the joke. Three guys are on top of a building. And one guy says to the other one, you know, uh, these buildings are so close together they form an air pocket. And if you were to fall off, the air pressure would carry you back up. Second guy says that's impossible. The first guy says watch. And he falls. And he's almost down to the bottom and whoosh, he comes back up. The second guy says that's amazing, I'm going to try it. He jumps, he falls, he dies. <laughs> the third guy says to the first guy, you know, you have a sick sense of humor, Superman. That's the joke. The rabbi told the joke, Superman's on top of a building with two people. And he says to one of them, <laughs> you see, you're not supposed to tell that part, you know? You're not supposed to bring Superman up. Now, now to show you how bad this is, this, this people who are humor impaired, you know, uh, uh, people will tell, when I, I've said this joke, oh, people say to me, tell the joke with Superman. <laughs> No, I said, that's like the you're punchline. Not to give once, away Superman. once you give away the punchline, you're kind of done. You're, you know? done. So, you're, you're, you're done. Yeah, so it's uh, kind of scary to hear a rabbi tell a joke, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I tell the joke, and then I just keep going. And if people laugh, it's like, oh, good, good. I got it. And if know? not, if one time you were at our event, I remember, and uh, you know, half the crowd was laughing, and the other half was not. So you're like, you know, I'll let the air, you know, <laughs> I'll let it move around yeah, the room. Yeah, I, <laughs> I. I uh, I sometimes I tell a joke. I, my general rule is that if the average audience gets sixty to seventy percent of my jokes, I'm okay. You know what I mean? Because a lot of them I do just to entertain myself. But every now and then I go tell a joke and you hear one guy laughing. <laughs> and the guy goes, ah, ah. Everyone's going, ah, ah. You have to hire some of those guys sometimes. You know? Yeah, listen, you know. The the important thing is that people have a good time. Right, right. And, and listen, what what's the Gemara about those two guys about the, the about the, 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 the guys that are going to go to Olam Haba and they were the two uh, the funny guys that yeah they would cheer people oh, up yeah. and make Shalom Ben Ish right 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 and they're they, make, they make Shalom between people and they would make people feel good you know and there was another of that started every year with a joke right Rabba 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 Hoskov Dicha Dichusa you would start with a joke and the reason is because what's great about a joke is you catch the audience it, it makes you every joke is based on the same principle and that's the unexpected right right you laugh at the unexpected. That's why Purim is the holiday of schleik, of laughter, because it's it's unexpected. You didn't think what right. was going to happen this way. You thought alpha. you knew what was going to happen. So um, it's uh, it changes things around, and then you're like, that makes you laugh. It's, you don't laugh at the obvious, right? right? Guy walks into a bar and orders a drink. Not very fair, right? A guy, guy walks, walks into, into a bar, bar and says, ouch. ouch. Right. <laughs> it's not much funnier, but at least it's a joke. <laughs> it's unexpected, you know? And I, you know, I, I always bring the example, you know, Woody Allen, he says, uh, we were poor growing up, I had to wear my cousin's hand-me-downs. And it was embarrassing because she wasn't my size. Right? <laughs> so you hear cousin, you assume boy cousin. Right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so it's the unexpected that, that, that makes you laugh, you know? So I once had this fellow, for Takufa, he was coming uh, to my shirim. He's an Englishman who was a lawyer 
he gave it up to become a storyteller at county fairs in England. So he came to watch, partly to hear the shurim, but also just to see my, my approach. What do right. I do? And he said to me afterwards, he said, what you do is hold up a funhouse mirror to life. You see yourself in it, but you're so distorted that you have to laugh. And that's, the, that's what Tzchai can do, you know? When, when you laugh at yourself, and you laugh at your foibles, and you laugh at these kind of things, you become more receptive. So, you know, sometimes people get it, you know, like there's this one guy, he says, I was sitting in your shear and you were just so funny, and I said, uh-oh, I know him. The funnier he gets, the harder he hits at the end. <laughs> <laughs> he says, he's just working on us. <laughs> so, what does the, what Chardron used to say that. Uh, you know, the maggot. The maggot, he used to say, you know, when you want a little kid to take his medicine, he won't open his mouth, you make him laugh, and then you strip it in, you know? <laughs> he says, so if you tell jokes, then you can, you know... You can get the, the muster. You can and get I a, see, you that's can get your approach. Saying, you, very you have, ideas, you have, you know? you're bringing in very professionally. So, very I wish subtle. I, could, I wish I could tell you it's really a, a whole mahalach. I just have to be funny, you know? Right. It's a, it's a gift. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Not that so many speakers have that gift, so you're Thank very, God. Very that's how I make a living. <laughs> I gotta have something going right. for me. <laughs> right. I'll tell you. I'll tell you one story, which is unbelievable. My father oh. believed that you could find a system to win at craps. Craps with? is a game with dice that you play in casinos. Uh -huh. And he was working on this in the last years of his life. And he used to say to me all the time, "I'm gonna leave the other children the the business, you know, and and the money, but I'm gonna leave you my crap system because <laughs> I know you'll never be able to support yourself." And this way you'll have a system to win, and you can always go down to Atlantic City and gamble for a few hours and make a living. <laughs> that's, that's what they've done about you. That's what he about me. And he never figured it out. But I always say my father in heaven said the same thing. He says, look, I know you have no skills to be able to support a family, so I'll make you funny. <laughs> <laughs> and this way people want to hear you. <laughs> How many siblings in the room? I'm one of six boys. Six boys. Six boys only. Yeah, there's no room for girls. We have <laughs> I'm actually bedrooms. one of five boys, so yeah, we're really? on the same base. Look at yeah, that. Close. Right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Rav Baruch Hashem has uh, Can I know her? Uh, um, I've got uh, six kids married. Baruch Hashem. Five to go. Ooh. And i got seven grandchildren. Can I know her? Baruch Hashem. And, uh, you know. That's great. That's great. Anything you want to say about the Rebbitzin, about how her dedication and letting the Rav travel the world? And you know, there's a... Uh, there's a famous story. Um, I've heard it many times, and uh, and um, you can't tell it over. <laughs> no, <I laughs> you've heard it. I'm, I'm trying to remember <laughs> where I, the last one I heard. Uh, but I know when when Ray Feldman was leaving Eretz Yisrael uh, to Rosh take over Eretz Yisrael. So his Rebbesim was working in Neve Yushalayim for many years, and um, and they had a goodbye for her. And he spoke, and he told the story. He says that he heard from his brother who was a, a rabbi in Atlanta for many years. He says, the governor of Georgia pulls up to a, to a gas station, if you're from down south, a filling station, and, uh, and if you're from England, a petrol station. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ling bilingual. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the gas station attendant comes over, and the wife sees him, the, the, the governess, you know, the gov governor, you know, and she goes up and starts moosing with him. And gets back in the car, and the governor says, who was that? He says, that was my old boyfriend from high school. So he says, uh, oh, you see that? Instead of being married to the governor of Georgia, you could have been married to a you know, gas station yeah, gas attendant. Station. She says, no, if I married him, he would have been the governor of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> so, so sometimes when I talk to girls, and I think a lot of girls have unrealistic expectations when they marry, uh, you know, when they get married, and, uh, you know, and I always tell them, you know, I, you know, I said, you should do what my wife did and settle, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he says, no, my, your wife married Rabbi Olavsky. And I said, no, my wife made Rabbi Olavsky, oh. you know. <laughs> I was the amazing Orlo when we met, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you were the magician, I'm a rabbi. Director, you know, <laughs> now I'm a famous rabbi, you know. Thanks to your wife. <laughs> That's right, 100%. Okay. Beautiful Rabbi Olavsky. So, you, you, would, I, I don't know if I should ask this question because you kind of answered it, but you'll tell me if you want to answer it differently. I'm saying I was going to end off by asking you to give leave a message to all of our audience, but I think the answer to that is that you already did by telling everyone that... Uh, you make a difference, and that's why I have to tell you, I live in Eretz Yisrael with my children and my grandchildren, and... Uh, oh, the, the married children are also in Eretz Yisrael? Yeah, I got everybody there. 
Nobody right. wants to leave. <laughs> my uh, one of my That's daughters good. married a, a actually a Forest Hills boy. Really, who yeah, is Lieberman? Is, uh, She's is been known. you know, their his parents are, are really pillars of the uh, Forest Hills community. Which uh, um, the uh, no Forest Hills Jewish Center. Oh, oh so uh, really interesting. Yeah. You remember when I spoke for Kazak in Queens and it was co-sponsored by Faisal Jewish Center? You're talking about the Queen Jewish Center. Queen Jewish Center. Faisal Jewish Center conservative. Right, right, right. I'm like, what? So, <laughs> <laughs> Queen's Jewish Center. Uh, yes, yes, um, yes. Sorry. So it was my future Machatenista who arranged it. No way! Yeah, I didn't know that she was going to be that is hilarious. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Who, knew, who knew? Connected her in that. that. But, uh, but in any event, so... Uh, um, but all my kids live in Israel, and uh, oh, sure. and my grandchildren. It's uh, really very special. Most of them go shopping in my kitchen. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they say, how do I need this one, and how do people make it? You know, they all take my food. That's <laughs> but anyway, Baruch um, Hashem, it's a it's a big schus. But um, uh, you know, I I stress the point again. We are experiencing Nisim Vineflos. Right. I heard and this from two people. Also, yes. 100%. I heard this from two people. I didn't check it out. I'm not Pesach Kron. You know Pesach Kron before he tells the story. Yeah, he, he checks, he it, checks out. it make sure. I just heard about it, so I believe it. I heard it from two people. <laughs> hey, the uh, Dover, so right? Two witnesses should be enough. Anyway, they said that a Hamas guy was interviewed on CNN, and they said, why is your aim so bad? Right, and he right. said, it's not, their God is protecting them. Right, right. We have experts sending these missiles. Right. You heard this too? Yes, yes. Right. I heard about it. It was in the newspapers. A uh, 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 head Hamas official said that. So, I mean, you know, there's no reason that they shouldn't be causing many, many more casualties. Right. But every missile is being blocked because some nice person, after davening, stopped to say a commit to Tehillim. Or, or, or you should know our community, Rabbi Lovsky, had already one, two, three, five Knossim, five gatherings with hundreds of people in each one. We read a lot of them. Well, we it's working. And we were united, yeah, and we're continuing to do so. bombs fall, and they most of them fall in open areas. Mm, that's and, right. and they, they're shooting in, in, in cities. It's miracles. It's mamish shooting miracles. In cities. Yes, I have family in Eretz Yisrael. They're telling me, and Eve, we just saw the Iron Dome and how it catches. It's mamish. It's it, it's miracles upon miracles. But the Iron Dome only hits some of them. Right. Most of them right. fall in they unpopular fall, areas. Right. Now, why should that be? You're shooting in cities. Right. You know, I just find unpopular. One of them fell in a lot in between two hotels. Unbelievable. In between two hotels, at the, the parking lot. Unbelievable. It's it's a, it's just nice in the flows, and it's because of all the good people right. out there who are saying feel us first. Right, feel us. You save lives. Tadaka, help me out. Uh, <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> I was I was gonna tell you one one thing on that. Um, you know, the Dafiomi people are doing Gemara Megillah now. Right. And uh, you ever hear people get up at the at a Shabbat brachas and they say, you know. Uh, I'll give a birchus head yet. Right, a, a, a simple hedget. guy giving simple a blessing. Simple guy giving a blessing, right. you know. It says that birchus head yet should never be kal be'enov. It's Gemara right. Megillah. Rishon Zalman says... Never take light uh, a blessing from a random person. So Rishon yeah. Zalman said, you obviously didn't learn the Gemara Megillah. It says, there's two instances that are quoted by the Gemara, and both of them are by non-Jewish kings. But by a Jew, there's no such a thing as a birchus head yet. A Jew never gives a pashit bracha. Every brach that a Jew gives is incredibly chashiv, which means, and it sounds weird, and I do it only because I know that it's true, even though I don't feel it. You know, somebody comes over to you and they don't have any children, you give them a brach and they can have a child. That's true. My brother has a story. Shlomo, I'm saying, Baruch Hashem, he's an amazing guy. He showed me Torah and he's a regular businessman, no, no rav, no, no. And he gave a bracha to a guy that had had children for 10 years. Within the year. Uh, you know what? You wanted a story I never told? Here it is. Oh, wow. It just yes. happened to me. I Exclusive spoke. story. Shadok <laughs> Network. Shadok Radio. Dun, 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 dun. Um, okay, drum roll, please. Now we go to an exclusive story. <laughs> uh, Rabbi Dvorin, who teaches in Derech. Um, I just spoke Shavos of Atamus, so this is pretty fresh. Um, and he came over and he told me this story. He says his wife was going into labor. And she, uh, they called the ambulance. And then she remembered that she has a neighbor who didn't have a child for like 10 years. Wow. They had like, you know, like, they had like uh, you know, one kid and then they couldn't have any more. And so she's, she's getting into the ambulance to go to the hospital and she calls up this neighbor and says, give me your name, I want to dive in for you during childbirth. Shh. So the woman was very touched, she gave her a name, you know. Four months later, I think, she calls her up and she says, look, I'm not announcing this, but I wanted to tell you I'm pregnant. Wow. And then she calls him up when the baby is born. 
and she checks the date, and it's the same birthday as her child who was born the day that she called her and said, I'm going to die with you. Exactly one year later, she yeah, had the won. baby on the same birthday. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, you know, uh, not to Ten years, away, no children, and... Not to take away from Rebbe Zendvar, I'm sure right. it's very choshev, but, you know, but, you know, you give a bracha to somebody, and they'll find a shidduch, and they'll, and they'll have children, and uh, maybe they, they'll get healthy, and they'll find a panasa, and uh, you, you don't know. You, you make a difference. Rabbi Arabsky, you're definitely not a, you know, a, a red one person. You're not I'm a red one person. So I do you're, you're a I'm part of the We're union. Ask <laughs> Call on and bless everyone. Ever. So, uh, by Sephardim, we do it every day. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. And Eretz Yisrael also, right? If, yeah. yeah. In fact, with Shteyman, when he would come uh, to America, he always dived in a Sephardish minion so he could do Birkus Kohanim. So, we're going to ask right now Rabbi Orlovsky to give all of our audience and all of Am Yisrael, everyone, to give a Birkat Kohanim. Right. Or... So, I'll give you the bracha that my mother always gives me before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. I wish you everything you wish for yourself. And in case you don't think so highly of yourself, I'll add to it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you think was like, your mother funny I, also? I, I, yeah. Is that where you got your she, genes? She wasn't funny. My father was very funny, but my mother had this laugh that when she would laugh, the whole room laughed. <laughs> very contagious laugh. But, um, um, uh, you know, I, I give everyone the bracha that you should be able to find your place in this world. Amen. The reason everybody looks different is because there's something that you can do in this world that nobody else can. And, and Every who, individual in each unique way has... <clears throat> right. You have something you can do in this world that nobody else can. And a Kosh Baruch should give you the strength to be able to believe in yourself and to be able to go out and to do something great in this world and to be able to change the world. Amen. And, you know, some people will start a major organization Woo, and okay. some of us will wander around and talk. <laughs> And some of us will just be a good friend who will sit on the phone and listen to people who right. need an ear to talk to. And some of us will do Hachnas Orchem, and some of us will do Chesed, and some of us, you know, will learn. And every one of us has a contribution we can make in this world that's unique, that will change the entire world. And eventually, big Mashiach Tzitkenu B'Meira B'Meinu. Amen. Thank you very much. This was another guest hour at the Chazak Radio. Thank you very much, Rabbi Arlovsky. A pleasure. It was amazing. God bless you. We should only hear Bissorot. Love Chazak. Love Chazak. <laughs> Here, and uh, if you want to visit us online, it's chazakradio.com, C H A Z A Q uh, radio.com. And uh, if you want to send us an email, comment about this show or any other show, it's radio at chazak.org. That's radio at C H A Z A Q.org. Rabbi Lasky, thank you very much. My pleasure. Very good. Amazing. Wow, this is going to be great. <laughs> I'm excited. Very good. Thank you, Rabbi Arlovsky. That was a pleasure. Yeah, it was great. It was very good. Have you oh. done this stuff before? Uh, not, I, you know, I used to speak on the radio. I used to give it my turn on the radio. So, uh -huh. this guy, Ruvain Subar. I don't know if you ever saw the children's tape, uh, Uncle Ruvain and the Mitzvah Train. Nope, nope, nope. So, that's him. So that's, you, you, he yeah. was the MC. And so, I, we, would, we would talk a little bit on the phone before I gave my Dvartar. So. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so we have everything over here. This is.